Hello, Keith Rucker here at VintageMachinery.org. Guys, uh, today we're going to do a little odds and ends video. I got a couple of events and contests and some things like that I want to tell you about. We got some viewer mail that's come in as well as some new purchases for the shop that I think you guys will find interested. So let's start out with uh, doing an announcement here. Most of you probably are already aware of this, but in case you were not, uh, the Bar Z Summer Bash is coming up here very shortly in a couple of weeks out in Rancho Cucamonga, California. Uh, as in past years, uh, I am planning on going out to that event again this year. And uh, it's an awesome time. There's a lot of YouTube uh, creators that go to this event each year. And it's an opportunity where YouTube viewers, you guys out there, uh, can meet up and actually meet a lot of these guys face to face, as well as come to an event with a lot of other people who are interested in this type of stuff like we're doing on the videos here. Uh, there's opportunities for, there's a big swap meet that they have, there's raffles that you can win prizes, uh, there's some classes that are going on, some different contests that are going on. It's just an all around good, fun time. And uh, I know I always enjoy going out to this event, mainly because I get a chance to meet a lot of you guys face to face and you get a chance to, you just get a chance to chat and say hello and put names with faces and really kind of see a lot of my viewers who have been around for a long time and are great supporters of my channel. So the Barzy Summer Bash is hosted by Stan Zinkowski over at Barzy Industrial. Uh, Stan has a little YouTube channel. If you haven't watched him, I'd encourage you to go take a look at his channel. Uh, and he's got a video where he talks about this event he basically goes through everything that's going to be going on and all the details, how to register, etc. I'm going to put a link to that video down in the description of this video. So if you go and look in the description, there'll be a link to go view Stan's video and it will tell you everything you know, need to know about the Barzi Summer Bash. But I'm going to give you a quick rundown right here, the highlights. The event, again, is going to be held June 18 and 19. That's a Friday and Saturday. This is for the 2021 event. Uh, and uh, this has been more or less an annual event uh, that he hosts usually around this time every year. Last year, uh, it was later in the summer due to COVID, but uh, we're getting back on track again here in 2021. Um, like I said, there's a big swap meet where people bring stuff in. If you got stuff you want to bring to sell, you can bring it to the swap meet. Uh, there's a raffle. You have to buy raffle tickets, but there's tons and tons and tons of really cool prizes. Stan goes way out, gets a lot of sponsors for this events that will send stuff in and then they have drawings throughout the day uh, where you can win these different things and I believe uh, go check the video out I believe that uh, he's allowing people to register for the raffle you don't have to be there to register for the raffle so I think that's right go check out the video if you want to put in a chance on winning some stuff if you can't even make it out uh, but Double check the video to make sure I'm right on that, but I'm pretty sure I remember him saying that. Um, the cost of the event is $30. That covers both days, and uh, he does provide lunch at the events. Uh, there's drinks, you know, uh, waters and Gatorades and whatever uh, to stay hydrated out there uh, and so forth like that. So you can just, you're, you're good to go. That basically covers all of that, the $30 registration fee. If you want to go again first, go check out the video. It's got a lot more details in it than what I'm giving you right now. Uh, but basically you need to send an email to Stan to register and that email address is summerbash at at barzyindustrial.com. And when you do that, Stan will send you more information. He'll send you a PayPal link to actually register for the event, uh, pay your money, and uh, all will be good. So hopefully we'll see some folks come out again June 18 through 19 out at the Barzy Summer Bash in Rancho Cucamonga, California. If you don't know where that says, Southern California, kind of uh, in the Los Angeles area, but pretty far east. It's not in the crazy part of Los Angeles, uh, uh, but it's actually a pretty nice area out there. Like I said, I've been to it several times. Uh, I usually fly into Ontario, California, which is really right there at Rancho Cucamonga, uh, and, um, and then rent a car and go up to the event. Of course, you can drive in as well. And I'm really looking forward to this event. And on a personal note, uh, this year, 
when I leave the Bardsey Summer Bash, I'm actually renting a car and driving to Wyoming, uh, which I'm going to be driving through some country I've never driven through before. And uh, my daughter is getting married the following weekend in Jackson, Wyoming, uh, at the Grand Teton National Park, which we're really looking forward to as well. So I'm going to be taking a little bit of a road trip. So when the Bardsey uh, Bash is over, uh, driving up going to drive up. I think I'm going to go up the back side of the Sierra Nevadas up toward uh, Lake Tahoe area uh, and then cut it over through um, Nevada, Utah, go up into uh, Idaho and then cut over to, to the Jackson area. So I'm going to spend a couple of days on the road making that trip and again looking forward to that as well. So anyway, again, June 18, 19, Barzi Summer Bash. If you want to register, send an email to summerbash at barziindustrial.com. Looking forward to seeing some of you guys out there. Related to the Barzi Summer Bash, one of the big sponsors for the Barzi Summer Bash is American Rotary Face Converters. They are also a sponsor of this channel. Uh, great guys, they make a great product. I use their rotary face converter to power all my three-phase machinery in my shop. Uh, but uh, they will be actually uh, giving away a rotary face converter in the raffle at the Barzi Summer Bash. But in addition, American Rotary is having a um, chance to win. Uh, you register for this and they're basically giving away a trip to go to their factory in Wisconsin uh, and they're going to cover everything. And, and basically what's included is airfare and lodging to their, uh, their plant up in uh, Wisconsin that's kind of just north of the Milwaukee area. I've been there before. Uh, it's a really neat place. Uh, you're going to get a chance to actually build a rotary face converter yourself. Tour, they're going to have some tours of some local manufacturers in the area. They're going to tour the Harley Davidson Museum, uh, visit local uh, breweries and restaurants, and it's going to be guided by uh, Chris Fievel uh, at American Rotary. And um, uh, anyway, really good opportunity here. I, and uh, th this will be a lot of fun. And and again, I'm going to put a link down in the description if you want to register for this trip to the American Rotary in Wisconsin, uh, basically an all-expense paid trip to go check them out. Uh, you can register to win. You just have to register uh, before midnight on June 18, 2021. This is actually going to be uh, part of the Barzi Summer Bash. Uh, again, you don't have to be at the Barzi Summer Bash to be eligible, but you can register online. I'll put a link down there. You just enter in to win and uh, yeah, be a fun trip to go see American Rotary. So there you go. Those two events or those two things I wanted to mention up at the beginning of the video. And again, hope some of you guys will be able to come out to the Bards East Summer Bash this year. Let's get in here. We got some viewer mail that's come in. Again, I've got a, a neat little purchase I'm gonna show you for the shop. So uh, let's work through all that. All right, first item here. This comes from uh, Eric Hoffmeiser up in Bowling Green, Kentucky, sent in a belt laser, uh, a vice-mounted belt laser. This is uh, made by Clipper, and this is for lacing together flat belts. And uh, this is something that we do quite frequently around here and out at the museum. I'm gonna be having to lace some belts for my planer restoration. And uh, I've actually got a different belt lacer, but this one here is, is nice because this one is one that you can just put in a vise, and when you put it in the vise, it squeezes the butt lacing together, so you can more or less carry this thing anywhere you go and be able to use it. The one that I've got is a floor-mounted one. It takes up a lot of room. It's really nice, uh, but if you're needing to go somewhere and, and lace belts, all you got to have is a vise to use this one, so really neat to have it. So the way this works is this is your belt lacing. It's basically just a bunch of little... Uh, clips a little that are pointed and you you put it down in this little slotted piece in the bottom uh, like such you take a pin right here and you catch all those you basically use a pin to lace the belts together All right, so that pin now is actually catching the bottom of that. You take this paper off, I'm not going to do it, but that leaves a little sharp point. So you put your belt down in here. Then you put this in a vise and clamp it together. It bends those little prongs together and uh, pull, you pull the pin out and you've got your belt lace. And then you can do that to the other side of the belt. Put them together, you take a pin, the uh, same diameter as this, 
put up between the lacing and uh, you can make an endless belt out of uh, where you can cut that belt and put it together basically. Really nice to do this when you're dealing with flat belts. Uh, they will stretch over time. You occasionally have to cut them and, and make them a little bit shorter. So it's real easy to do that when you have lacing in there. You just cut an inch off or so and put them back together and keep right on rolling. Anyway, uh, Eric sent this along. This will be a nice little addition to the shop. He also sent along some, some lacing ready to go. Uh, and like I said, we'll probably need be, or not probably, we will be needing to lay some belts coming up very soon for the metal planer restoration. And uh, I'm glad to have this one. And again, this is one that if I'm going somewhere else and might need to lay some belts, I don't have to pack up that big belt lacer that I got. I can just throw this one in toolbox and off I can go. So this will be a really nice addition. Great shape, looks like it's hardly been used and um, ready to roll. So again, very nice addition to the shop. Thank you, Eric, for sending that along. Lewis Krupp out in Boulder, Colorado sent along some really cool books and uh, always nice to have references here. First one up here, uh, Practical Tracy on the uh, Steam Engine Indicator. I actually showed this book. I've got a, another copy of this book what I showed with my Steam Indicator that I picked up not too long ago that talks how to use a Steam Indicator. I think we had that in a previous odds and ends episode. So uh, anyway, nice one. This is actually a duplicate copy for me, but I think the rest of these I don't have. This is uh, let's see, uh, Max's instructions on um, the boiler room. So steam related stuff here, um, related to, to steam boilers, nice reference to have. Uh, this one here is stationary marine gas and locomotive engines. And again, uh, kind of a, just a book that has everything in there. This is called the new catechism of the steam engine. Now, if you're not familiar with what a catechism is, a catechism is kind of a series of questions and answers. And back in the day when people were studying to become an engineer for something like this, they would have to pass a oral test and they would basically be rid uh, read questions and they would expect to know the answer and basically this book would have the questions and answers in there and you were more or less expected to memorize most of the stuff or at least be able to explain it so they're like a question uh, what is a right hand engine answer the engine uh, an engine the flywheel of which is to the right as looked at from the cylinders etc etc you would have to know all this information to become a engineer uh, for doing steam. Uh, Pelton Water Wheels. This is an interesting uh, book. I actually saw a uh, video that someone did not too long ago talking about this company and their water wheels. Uh, this is a California-based company. They made these water wheels for, for powering uh, different things. Um, it's a special kind of water wheel. Let's see, there was a picture of one in here. There you go. It looks kind of like this right here. And it would you could hook all kinds of stuff up to this so again back in the day before electric motors if you needed a uh, uh, power for something you could use a water wheel like this right here and uh, this is actually a, says 5,000 horsepower Pelton wheel there so I'm sure they had a pretty good uh, head of water to power that and it talks about you know, all kind of making your dam and everything else in here. Really interesting book. I, I, I enjoyed looking through this earlier. And uh, let's see, the last one here is the Steam Power Plant Engineering. Um, again, just a good reference book to have on uh, steam related stuff. So anyway, some really nice books from Lewis. Thank you very much for seeing these along. I will add these to my library. And uh, like I've said before, it's always nice to have these reference books. When you're working with old equipment and uh, being able to go pull books off your shelf that talks about some of this stuff really has been helpful to me in uh, doing a lot of the type of restoration work that I do. So uh, thank you very much for seeing this along with us. Up next, uh, this was actually a purchase that I made from a viewer that contacted me, uh, Ryan Shank, uh, had a big DA tool holder. And um, I've actually got an Aloris DA tool uh, block that I'm planning to use with my big Monarch lathe whenever I get it up and running. I've still, that's kind of my next thing to finish up after I finish my planer, I think. Uh, but I've already got the, the, the tool 
block and I've actually got some tool holders, but uh, he contacted me, asked me if I could use this. And I'm like, yeah, I'd love to have it to throw over there and just have in the inventory, the arsenal, uh, because these uh, DA holders are a little bit harder to find, a little bit larger ones than, than like the CAs and the BAs and so forth like that, the CXAs. Um, anyway, nice to have. Thank you for giving me the opportunity, Ryan, and uh, we'll definitely put her to use. So up next, I got some taps that were sent in to me by G. Harper up in Belvedere, Illinois. And uh, these are some unusual taps and actually something that I think will be useful around here. I know they'll be useful around here. These are half inch 12 pitch. So half inch diameter, 12 threads per inch. Now, if you know a lot about machining, Normally, a standard half inch thread is half inch 13 threads per inch. But back in the day before all this stuff was standardized in the early 1900s or up through the early 1900s, a lot of your thread sizes could be just whatever the manufacturer wanted to make. And it was fairly common back in those days to have half inch 12. Uh, in fact, it was really almost a standard at the time along with half inch 13. Eventually half inch 13 did become the standard but a lot of your early machinery used half inch 12 uh, threads on it. I know I first ran into this years ago when I was restoring an old bandsaw that was made in the 19 teens and uh, I had was repairing a broken casting. It had some half inch bolts or not bolts, they were actually a special uh, uh, threaded piece that pulled that threaded in there and um, I had the new part made I, I had new castings made and I just measured it it was half inch I tapped them half inch 13 and lo and behold the parts that fit in them wouldn't fit uh, because it was the wrong thread and I really banged my head against the wall for a while why is this not threading in there why is this not working and i eventually got a thread pitch gauge and discovered it was half inch 12. never heard of it before and i have heard from lots of other people similar things have happened over the years i ended up having to make the parts to fit in there at half inch 13 because I didn't want to have to remake the whole thing um, the, have a new casting done and everything else since then, I have gotten some half inch 12 taps. I've got one I know somewhere around in the shop um, because I've had to use it many times over the years. Uh, but these are actually all half inch 12. He told me he found these in a toolbox or something. I can't remember exactly the deal, but he had multiples of them, more than he could use. Asked if I'd be interested in having a few. Absolutely, because these things come up more often than you would think, at least on older machinery like I'm usually restoring. So, I'm gonna put them here in a little little uh, container, marked half inch 12 in there. I'll put these over in my cabinet and I'll have these down the road uh, if I need them for when that next time I come up with a half inch 12 uh, hole that I need to tap, I'm gonna be set to go. These are all made by uh, Greenfield Tap and Die. Uh, which is a really good manufacturer. I, I really like their stuff. So really high quality taps made back in the day. Up next, got a collection of books that was sent in by Luke Bucks. Luke is a guy that used to live over near Columbus, Georgia, and has been over to my shop several times over the years. He's actually helped me out on a couple of projects in here when he used to live closer. They recently moved up north, uh, but he just sent along some books that he picked up somewhere along the line that he thought I could use, and glad to have them. So first off, these are some railway guides, interchange rules, so basically rules of the road. Um, this one's dated 1963. There's another one from 67 and another one from 68 from the Association of American Railroads Operations and Maintenance Department Mechanical Division. And like I said, just lots of general information related to railroading stuff. These will be um, nice resources to have in the shop. I uh, also got a manual of instructions on air brakes and air Train air signals for engine men and train men. Dated 1934. This is from the uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul, Pacific Railroad. And the Chicago Car Interchange Bureau. Uh, this is their constitution rules of, of governing. Uh, up here we got power plant engineering questions and answers. Again, this is kind of just one of those study books uh learning about your your trade learning the questions and answers that you need to know to uh 
pass the test and move on up and become certified at different levels. Uh, tool application handbook, this is basically inserts for Kenna Metal. Um, this is interesting, locomotive advertising in America in 1850 to 1900. So these are just uh, literally advertisements out of different publications advertising locomotives. Pretty cool stuff. This is a book on locomotive valves and valve gears. So a valve gear basically uh, was like the reversing gear that would allow the locomotive to reverse. It changes the position of the valves in the steam engine and basically reverses the direction that the engine's turning. And uh, locomotives had different types of valve gears on them. Uh, reversing gears are often called, and this is a book all about those. So again, a nice, uh, nice reference to have. I know our locomotive out at the museum has a Stevenson gear on it, and uh, I've actually had to do some work on it before, and, and I'm sure, there you go, the Stevenson valve gear. So there's probably a whole chapter in here talking about that particular uh, type. There's multiple types. They all basically do the same thing, but there were different types. Different railroads and different manufacturers use them, uh, but they all do the same thing. They, they change the position of the valves in the engine and allow you to reverse the engine. Uh, traction Engine Troubles. This is a reprint from the old Iron Man album, which was a magazine that used to be published uh, related to steam traction engines and so forth. And uh, this one is from the 1970s, if I remember right. Uh, but it's all about running traction engines and keeping them up to date. And there's setting valves and all kinds of stuff in here on there governing. So nice little reference to have and then we got some foundry and pattern making books so pattern making is something i've always been interested in and i've done a fair amount of it over the years uh, making reproduction parts having them have new castings done and um, i don't have many books on pattern making i got a few they've been extremely helpful to me learning this trade learning this art of pattern making and i'm really kind of looking forward to getting in here and studying some of these but it's all about making patterns they used to make them mostly out of wood um, for doing castings and this is all about pattern making here's another one on pattern making uh, same type stuff just a different different book and then uh, we got another one here on foundry work which is another one i'm interested in looking at uh, all about doing foundry work so anyway, Luke, thanks for sending these along. I'm going to add them to the library. I'm going to be doing some study and looking through them first. Uh, thanks for sending them. Up next, got a couple of channel stickers that were sent in by Billy Huddleston uh, up at Knox Machining in Knoxville, Tennessee. It's kind of uh, funny. He had sent these a while back, and I've had them over there in my pile of show. And just last weekend, I was invited to be on a kind of a podcast, a YouTube podcast done by Harold Walters, the uh, uh, amateur redneck workshopper, ARW uh, channel. He does a kind of a, I think it's a monthly or maybe weekly, I can't remember, kind of a podcast. We'll invite different YouTube guys on there and just talk about stuff and people can send in questions and what have you. Anyway, I was invited to be on that this past week and uh, Billy over here at Knox Machining was on that same episode. He asked me about the stickers. I said, yeah, I think I got those. It's been a while since I'd seen them, since it's been, been a while since we've done one of these videos. But anyway, I dug them out this week. They were over there in my pile. So two different ones. Uh, one is his YouTube channel, Knox Machining. And the other one is for KnoxMakers.org. He actually helps uh, with a makerspace in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, and uh, that's the sticker for their makerspace. This is his personal uh, channel that he has. So go check them out. And if you want to listen to that podcast we did, I'll put a link to that down in the description as well uh, for the uh, uh, discussion that we had last week. So up next, got some items that were sent in to me by Peter Koth uh, up in Arkansas. Peter is a 
friend of mine again. Uh, he actually came to one of my scraping classes a while back, got to know him. His wife came down with him, got to know both of them. And um, he sent these items along to me. Uh, interestingly, I've actually been to Peter's uh, shop and house before a couple years ago. My buddy Lance Balsley and I went to Arkansas to pick up some machinery and Peter was kind enough to, uh, he actually invited us to come stay with him overnight. And uh, we got to visit his shop and everything like that. But anyway, Peter, Peter sent along a couple of items here. First off, we got some inserts, some TNMG 432 inserts. These are a triangular insert. I believe I got some tool holders that will use these. Uh, I'm going to put these over in my insert box or drawer and have them later on. Next, we got a Acme tap. So Acme taps, of course, Acme threads are a little bit different than regular threads or wider. And a lot of times they'll start with a, a narrower profile and get that cut out and then come back in with the full depth, full profile on a second pass. And this particular, sometimes you have two different taps. This one happens to have both of them in there together. This is a one inch, five pitch um, Acme tap. So I'm gonna put these in my other Acme taps and have them. And last thing, he sent along a little uh, plastic cover that goes on my digital readout on my milling machine. When I got it, there was one on it. I don't really know whatever happened to that plastic cover, but it, he said he had an extra one laying around. Notice I didn't have one. Not sure why he had an extra one, but he did. And anyway, I'm gonna put this over on my digital readout on the middle machine to protect it from dust and grease and grime and everything else. So, Peter, thanks for sending it along. So up next is a recent purchase that I made for the shop, and that is with some straight edges that I use with my machinery building. And uh, this is actually some items that I was, I had a viewer that reached out to me, Joseph Palma, who lives up in the, Chicago, Milwaukee area. I can't remember exactly. I think Milwaukee. But he had uh, was aware of these three pieces that were for sale locally. A shop was going out of business or a person had them for sale. I don't remember the details. But he said, hey, if you're interested in this, you know, just letting you know about it. And yes, I was interested in it. And we were, I was able to work out a deal on these three items. And Joseph was kind enough to actually go pick them up for me and pay the person. I sent him the money. He uh, went and, and paid the person and picked them up and brought them to where he worked at and held them. And then another friend of mine came up uh, that was had actually li lives up in that area, was going down to Florida. He actually picked them up and brought them down to me. Uh, but Joseph also had the smaller straight edges edge and uh, he sold me that one as well. So all in all, picked up some really nice straight edges. This big one in the back is a brown and sharp. Uh, this is an eight foot long straight edge. One of the larger ones that they made. They did make a few that were a little bit bigger than this, but this is the biggest one that I've got now. Uh, the smaller one up front, also brown and sharp, that is a 30 inch. And again, that was a size that I did not have. These two are actually granite straight edges. And actually, I think that these were fixtures that were on some type of like um, measuring coordinate system or something like that. I'm not, I don't know exactly where they came from, but I think they've been repurposed. But it really doesn't matter. These are, have been lapped. They're flat, at least on the edges. And uh, the person that was using them before was using them as straight edges. These can be used just like the cast iron ones. Uh, they're a little bit heavier, but uh, it's actually probably a little better surface than the cast iron ones. The cast iron ones, you basically have to uh, calibrate on a surface plate that's been calibrated before. Everything just has to check on itself. You'll blue these up, scrape them in, and then you can take the straight edge to a machine easier than you can take a great big surface plate to a machine. And uh, you use these for checking things for flatness and straightness and so forth like that. Again, used in precision machine rebuilding. Since I've gotten into machine rebuilding and scraping, I've actually put together a pretty good collection of straight edges, these brown and sharp style um, that don't have the dovetail, they're just flat on them. Uh, I've got most of the sizes now that are available. I've got a brown and sharp catalog 
and they offered these in multiple sizes. An 18 inch was the smallest one. I actually have an 18 inch one. They had a 24 inch one or two footer. I don't have a two footer. That's one of the few sizes I don't have, believe it or not. And I just haven't found one in that size yet. Um, here's the 30 inch one right here. Just pick that one up. And then they go to a three foot, which I've got, I'm, I think my, a couple of them are not brown and sharp, but they're basically all, basically the same. It's just different. I think I got some challenges, uh, challenge brands over there, but they're almost identical uh, to these. But anyway, I've got a 36 inch, three foot, a four foot, a five foot, a six foot. Uh, I've used the six foot a couple of times, that thing's heavy. And then now the uh, eight foot one back here. And this one, I actually will probably use this when I do my horizontal boring mill. It's got a seven foot bed on it. So uh, this will be very helpful to use, to, to kind of use that for. Now, the ones that I don't have that they made, again, it's a 24 inch one. Brown and Sharp made a seven foot one. So basically a foot shorter than this one. Uh, I've got the six foot, I go to eight foot. From eight foot, they went to a 10 foot one, 120 inches. I don't have that one. I don't know that I really need one. If one were to show up at a reasonable price, I'd probably buy it, but uh, I'm not gonna spend a whole bunch of money on one of those. I, I don't know that I would ever, ever need a 10 foot one. Uh, and plus, I got a friend that does have one that would let me borrow his if I ever needed it. And Brown and Sharp also made on special order only a 144 inch, which is a uh, 12 foot. And then they made a 180 inch one, which is, was that uh, 15 feet, I think. Uh, so those were available, but you had to, they were basically custom built, made to order only. Um, they, you, you could order them, you, you had to wait to have them built or made, but they were out there. I've never seen a uh, 12 and 15 footer. Uh, I'm sure there's a few out there, but they're probably pretty rare. Actually, even these eight and 10 foot ones are pretty hard to find. But anyway, nice addition to the shop. I'm gonna probably take these bigger ones and put in my storage building, just so they're kind of out of the way and not cluttering up the shop. These things are big and heavy and awkward, so I'm just gonna probably store them up there, but have them when I need them. And like I said, I've got a job for this one coming up, so um, I know this one will get used at some point. Uh, Anyway, nice to have a good selection of these for whatever job comes up. Well guys, with that, I think that is going to be a wrap on this episode. Hope you saw some interesting things and uh, got something out of this. Uh, looking forward, hopefully to seeing some of you guys out at the Bar Z Bash here in a couple of weeks. Uh, consider coming to that, it'd be a lot of fun if you've never been to one of those events. Uh, we'd love to love to see you, love to shake your hand, love to have a chance to chat with some of you guys uh, while we're out there in California at the Bar Z Bash. And uh, with that, guys, as always, thanks for watching. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Thumbs up, comments are appreciated. Hit the bell icon to get those notifications. And with that, we'll catch you on the next video. Again, thanks for watching.